They say it takes a village to raise a child. I say it takes an entire planet. Imagine your typical day. You wake up, you get out of bed, you have a healthy breakfast, perhaps with some vitamins, then you take a quick shower, get dressed, and go to work. For lunch, you go to a local restaurant. When you come home, you go for a quick run before the rain comes. Perhaps you decide to do a little bit of gardening and yard work. For supper, you have steak and potatoes, served with wine, and for dessert, an apple pie. Then you read a book and cuddle with your family and pets before you go to bed. Now think for a moment what makes a typical day possible for you. Everything we own and use do not come from people. They have always originated or come from forests. It is easy to see the relationship between forests and us because of the tangible benefits they provide, such as food in our pantries and furniture in our house. However, it is much more difficult to see all the intangible benefits that the forests provide us on a daily basis. Forests stabilize soils and affect rainfall patterns, allowing crops to grow. They even protect us, as without forests, we would have more drought, flooding, and disease events. The clean air we breathe is complements of the most massive and efficient air filtration system in the world. And let's not forget that forests are places where we relax and where many beautiful memories with our friends and families are created. Forests are our pantries, medicine cabinets, oxygen and water sources, and spiritual sanctuaries. And yet, as critical as forests have been to our existence, they have largely been mismanaged. Ancient civilizations, such as the Vikings, Mayans, and Easter Islanders, vanished partially because they overused their forest resources. Yet the biggest threat to our forests today is not overuse, at least in the US. It is the repeated invasion of non-native species, which are species that have been moved beyond their native geographical range. In fact, non-native species are considered the second largest leading cause of loss of native biodiversity. Our forests have changed irreversibly because of non-native species. As a forest entomologist at the Warnell School of Forestry and Natural Resources, here at the University of Georgia, I spend more than half my time researching non-native species. It is frustrating to me that in many different ways, we know a lot more about a non-native species than we know about our native ones because of their tremendous impacts. For those of you who grew up in the southern US, you grew up with non-native species, perhaps even realizing it. We all remember the stings of fire ants that have originated from South America, and kudzu, which is so common along the roadways and open fields, came from East Asia. Our history with the non-native species began in the 17th century with the first European colonization, where many of these species hitchhiked on ships, containers, goods, and luggages. However, not all introductions have been accidental. A classic example is that of starlings that were introduced by Eugene Shefflin, president of the American Acclimatization Society, because he wanted to have all the birds mentioned in William Shakespeare's plays represented in the New World. Today, starlings are considered the top 100 worst non-native species around the world because of the impact on crops and native birds. It sounds ridiculous, doesn't it, that we have introduced non-native species based on emotional value rather than sound scientific facts. Initially, many of these introductions were slow because of a general lack of trade and commerce around the world. However, as we have become globalized, these 
introductions have increased exponentially. As we have moved around the planet, so have these non-native species. The ecological impact of non-native species is staggering as they have changed our forests forever. The chestnut trees were the iconic American tree considered redwood of the East Coast and provided many different products that were used from cribs to caskets. About a quarter of all the trees on the East Coast were chestnuts that grew to over 100 feet and provided an abundance of nuts each year. These chestnut forests provided food and resources for many different wildlife species and humans. However, since the introduction of the non-native chestnut blight, these iconic forests have vanished forever and have not been seen by the last two to three generations. We are witnessing a loss of our other native trees as well, such as ash trees, which are being decimated by emerald ash borer, maples by Asian longhorn beetle, and hemlocks by hemlock woolly adelgid. Loss of native trees invariably results in loss of native animal and plant species associated with, with, with those habitats. It is estimated that about 50% of our native species are endangered because of the non-native species. Sometimes non-native species can directly outcompete native ones. For example, kogan grass that grows so densely that no other plant can be present in the understory. Predators such as the brown tree snake has virtually eliminated most of the native birds in Guam. Non-native species can also hybridize with the native ones so that the original genetic diversity is lost. However, we are not only concerned about the ecological impacts because the economic costs have been staggering as they cost about over $130 billion of loss each year in the US alone. In many instances, these loss are only noticeable when they occur in our own backyard. For example, emerald ash borer that has killed tens of millions of ash trees along the East Coast overwhelmed the local communities with wood. Just for removal, replanting, and habitat restoration, emerald ash borer has costed over $10 billion of loss on the East Coast. Now in the southeastern US, which is where we are, we are considered the wood basket of the world because we're a major producer of pulp wood and saw timber around the world. In Georgia, we are exceptionally fortunate because about 70% of our land is forested. In fact, forestry is considered the second largest industry in the state, providing over 60 billion timber and non-timber value to the state, along with 140,000 jobs per year. Now just imagine if we would introduce a non-native species that could kill our pine trees. We would lose these trees along with tens and thousands of jobs and the small communities that persist around with these industries with the cultures and histories will vanish forever. As humans, we have played the most important role in movement of non-native species around the world, which means that we can play an equally important role in stopping the invasion process. The good news is we don't need to make large changes in our lifestyle. Rather, small changes along being conscious of the threat are the first steps to solving this problem. So let me offer you a few ways in terms of what we can incorporate in our daily lives. First of all, think of planting native species instead of just the prettiest ones at the store. Secondly, when you go camping, buy local firewood as opposed to bringing it from somewhere else. You would be surprised to know how many non-native insects are moved around in the firewood alone. And finally, think of volunteering at local parks, nature centers, and preserves to assist with removal of non-native species and habitat restoration efforts. Imagine losing all our trees and left with nothing 
but grasslands. That's the future, unless and until we decide to do something about it. Just like we have created these tremendous ecological and economic issues with non-native species, we're just as capable of getting rid of them. But that would mean making small, yet persistent and significant changes in our lifestyles together. It takes an entire planet for us to have a typical day. Yet the choices we make in that typical day can have positive impacts on the planet's future. Thank you.